after after the last two weeks of taking a, a little break from from uh, First Thessalonians and looking at the the om, omniscience and omnipresence of God two weeks ago and and uh, and then last week having our Easter service today we'll go back to First Thessalonians and we're kind of halfway into or two thirds of the way through through chapter number two. So First Thessalonians chapter number two. Had, uh, I had Second Thessalonians open, so that would be okay. No, we got into verse 17, uh, uh, verse 16 we ended at, and we never even made it to chapter 3 yet. So, But verse, uh, verse uh, let's start with verse number 1 of First Thessalonians chapter 2. For yourselves, brethren... Know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain, but even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God to put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts, for neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been, more, been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know how we exhorted and, con and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause we also thank we God without ceasing, because when, when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have the, of the Jews, who, have, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their, own, and their own prophets, and have persecuted us. And they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up that up their sins always, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endure, endeared, uh, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire, wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and joy. And Lord, we do pray that you would bless this, uh, this word which belongs to you, to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so our, our focus is on, on verses 17 through 20 this morning. And and this will close up Second uh, First Thessalonians chapter number two. It says, but we brethren being taken from you uh, for a short time in presence. What had happened is we if well, why don't we just go back to the where it happened? Acts chapter seventeen. Acts seventeen.
in verse number, uh, let's go to verse 1. Kind of review the whole, the whole story here. It says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews, and Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few, but the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they had found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren into the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they, tr and they troubled the people and the rulers of the city, when they heard these things, and when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now I have to read verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether these things were so, therefore, I'm gonna, therefore many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, not a few. I'm gonna stop right there. So we see in Thessalonica, how long was, was Paul there? He, was, he, he, he taught on three Sabbath days. So it was a, a space of around three weeks. He was in Thessalonica. We had, we had, some believed, some Greeks believed, but then we have the but. But those that were the Jews that did not believe did their normal thing. They raised up trouble, and, and Paul had to leave Thessalonica after just a short amount of time. So that's what, what he was taken away from them. But what happens, it says, But we, brethren, being taken away from you a short time in presence... He was, he was taken out of Thessalonica because of the persecution by the unbelieving Jews so that those who were left, the, I, I guess we would call it the remnant, the, 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 the few, the proud, the marines, call it what you will, they stuck along, they stuck by what Paul was teaching. And this was a joy to Paul. He wasn't there physically with them, though, even though that would have been a greater thing. He wasn't there with them. They had received the message. We're in much conflict from their own countrymen as the Jews you know, inflicted punishment and judgment upon, upon those back in Judea. They did the same thing. They, didn't, they, they threw it all. They believed. You know, I'm sure the synagogue was still packed. But when they met at Jason's house, which, which hosted them, which he was beaten, beaten up for, for hosting these men that turned the world upside down and let go, they, we, it doesn't say how many. It's not a few. There was, wasn't a, a big majority of people that believed. But yet, those that believed, this was the source of joy for Paul, even though he wasn't able to be there. Look at the second part of uh, the second part of the verse number 17. It says, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart. God held a special place for these people, these believers in Thessalonica. They, there was a special place in his heart that he had uh, 
they, you know, he was there. He was taken away from Thessalonica, and later, when he was went to uh, went to meet them, he had to be escorted out of out of Athens by because of the Jews lying in wait. This is found in Acts chapter eighteen. So he wasn't even to make a return trip after he was leaving after he left there. So so he was left. We're not sure if he ever got to visit the Thessalonians. Uh, the Thessalonians, rather, but yet he, we see that he did leave Timothy and Silas there when he wrote this some years later, more than likely from Athens or Rome. Uh, he's hearing the wonderful news of the steadfastness of the Thessalonians. This brought joy to Paul. You know, don't you love hearing great stories of of people who have triumphed through tragedy by keeping their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. It's a, I have to find the article, but it's, a, it's an article that came out several years ago. You remember in, how many remember the Vietnam War? Hardly any of, us, any of us remember, but there was a little girl that was in a picture with one, an American soldier. Right, a little little tiny girl, three year old girl, and she became a Christian. I can't remember what her name was, but she became a Christian, and she talks about uh, how how horrible living in that country was, and the and the and all the things that happened. But yet, she trusted the Lord and continues to trust the Lord to this day. She could tell you about you know what happened then. But her, her, her focus became changed. Now lo no, no longer focused on the, the political issues or contemporary issues of the here and now. Her, her focus was now on the heavenly. And this is what happened with, 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 with the believers in Thessalonica. They were great news and a comfort to him to hear of their, how well they were doing. You know, wherever he was, brought, was What's the term we like to use? It's music to my ears. You know, don't you love it when you meet a believer halfway around the world and you meet somebody and it's like you've known each other for years? That's, the, that's what Paul had in his heart for the Thessalonians, that he, uh, Thessalonians who he couldn't be with. Let's go over to, uh, uh, let, let's just continue here. Uh, it says, wherefore, verse number 18, wherefore, oh, wait a minute, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. He, he endeavored, he, he wanted to get back there, back to Thessalonica to see those people who he had seen for just that short amount of time, but yet he wasn't able to. Verse number 18, Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul. Remember, at the time of this writing, Silas and Timothy, or Timotheus, were, were there with them in Thessalonica. But Paul was unable to do so. He says, Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. You, know, you always ask the, the question, how could Satan hinder Paul? Well, he did all over the place through the persecutions that he suffered. In, uh, uh, in 2 Corinthians 12, why don't we go there? It's a good place to go. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We got to go to verse one. No, I have to go to verse one. My, my electronic Bible has suddenly gone into paragraph mode, so you can't. I can't see the verses. <laughs> Usually, it's in in verse mode where the verses are separated. I don't know what happened to it, but it was a good plan, right? Verse number twelve. We all know this. We we've all heard this. I think 
It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for man to utter, of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. So Paul, I, I believe Paul was talking about himself there, but basically saying, I'm not going to talk about me here. I'm gonna, I, have, I have all these things that happened because of his apostleship, visions and revelations. You know, Jesus Christ personally visited with him, revealed himself to him. So he had these, we know that, but yet he wasn't going to put them, put them up on a par with, with somebody today. I heard a vision from God. You know, I, I still remember, I might have shared this before, uh, Kenneth Copeland had a vision of Jesus Christ coming into his bedroom with a plate of cookies. I kid you not, I had to go back and find that myself. I was like, what kind of nonsense is that? But yet people will flock to, to, to see these self-appointed prophets of today. Though all kinds of different things like that, but Paul put himself below. He says, I'm not gonna glory in those visions, I'm going to glory in my affirmities. Try that. Something we have to face each and every day, our aging, uh, aging bodies, the stories of cancer that we, that we hear all over the place. All these things are effects of, of our old flesh that, that we still have. You know, I, I look back to the days when I didn't need glasses. Amen. I look back to the days I used to have brown hair and not white and gray and whatever assorted colors. You know, all, all those different things. I glory in my affirmance. That's what Paul did. He knew what, what reason he was being, being persecuted. He was being persecuted for the cause of Christ. But we have natural affection, uh, na natural afflictions that take place. You know, have you ever tried to, to cast away your afflictions? It doesn't work that way, does it? I know, I know a relative that one time he was told he had a demon of sinuses. That's why he had sinus infection. No, you have sinus infection because you're in a cursed body. You're in, you're in a body that's still under the curse of Adam that's dying and decaying. So all these different things. <coughs> So Paul says, Satan hindered us. Of such a one will, I, uh, will, uh, one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine affliction, infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. He didn't want, oh, here comes the great apostle Paul is coming. And yes, he had, he had the gift of healing at one time, but at the end of his ministry, he didn't. He had to leave Trophimus sick in Miletus. So we see that transition of, of those apostolic gifts fading away. And so Paul himself didn't even look for, he, he looked for healing. He looked to have this this uh, infirmity taken away. He says that verse number, uh, verse number, I almost said M, that's the, the, the footnote. Verse number seven, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. A lot of people have, you know, tried to figure out what the thorn in the flesh and a lot of the things are, Legitimate, he had eye problems, back problems, ear problems. You know, he was bruised and beaten all the time. But I think what the, what, the, what the thorn in the flesh 
was personally the messenger of Satan. Because there was a messenger of Satan. Satan, you would see in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he appears as an angel of light. He appears in many forms. His, his ministers appear in many ways. So wherever he went, there was a minister of Satan or the messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure. So where, wherever Paul went, what happened to him? He didn't get a hero's welcome to wherever he went. He got beaten by the Jews wherever he went. And what would we call a gospel that's another gospel? We would call it accursed. We would call it a lie. So we had these messengers of Satan everywhere that he went to buffet him. He wanted to take him out of the scene so they could continue with their law-based religion and keep people in the dark. Much the same way as Jesus Christ himself was rejected by the, the leaders of Israel. They wanted control. It's nothing like control of the world, is there? But yet, is what, what happened after the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me, and he said unto me. So, th so three times he says, he asked the Lord for this thing to depart from him. You know, I, can, you, can you just picture for a moment, can picture for a moment, Paul saying, Lord, why am I going through these things? Can't you take it away? Could the Lord have taken the buffeting away? He could have. Does he do that sometimes even today? Sure. But yet for God's purpose here, his purpose was in Paul suffering. So look at what it says. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So he took glory in those infirmities. Why did God choose the nation of Israel as his chosen nation? He says, not because they were powerful or mighty, but because they were weak and lowly. He chose them. He cho chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. You know how many people out there trying to heal people? All kinds of different people. They have the wrong picture of human suffering and human nature. You know, I have some bad news today. Each of us in the building here, if it aren't, isn't, if the rapture doesn't happen first, just let it happen. If the rapture doesn't happen first, we'll be next not to exist in human form anymore. We'll be next to have a service for, of, of burial. But yet, that's why we glory in those infirmities. We, we glory, we know that this earthly body, this earthly tent or tabernacle will one day perish, but we have a tabernacle from on high. Oh, I... 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is one of those unplanned places. Verse number 1. And this was, this was intended to be. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved... We have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. I'd do the mic drop thing again if I could, but Let, let's, go, let's go back for a second and let's go before the four and we go to verse 17. That doesn't work. That has stats without four. Uh, well, 
Let's go back to uh, chapter 4, verse, 17, verse 14. It says, Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Verse 17 is one of my favorites. For our light affliction. You know, on this side of eternity, there's actually no such thing as heavy affliction. For our light affliction, that's, that's compared with the glory of God, what we go through now, even though it certainly doesn't feel light, right? For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. That's why I think the older you get, the time passes by because you're afflicted more and more as you get old. Yes, senioritis is not only for high school seniors who skipped the last couple days, it's for those of us that are over 50. <laughs> Amen, our bodies do groan, they literally groan. For our light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we look not at the things which are seen. Do we see Jesus today? No. We see some replicas of him, but it's not Jesus. I saw, our, what did I see, the, a picture of, of Jesus in the clouds. It's like, how do we know it's even Jesus? How do we know if the pictures that we grew up our whole lifetime with, G, with Jesus with the long white clothes and and long hair and a mustache and beard, how do we know that's even him and not some imitator? We don't know. They could very well have it right, but I think more than likely not. You know, he was, even before he was crucified, he was a man that was not comely. He wasn't anything to look at. He wasn't that hunk of hunk of burning love that he's, that he's portrayed in the old, the old movies in the 60s. Remember, who was that guy with the he had deep blue eyes? You know, Timothy Hutton, a, 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 an actor. You know, just wowed people. They loved that Jesus. Blue-eyed Jesus was a popular Jesus, but we have no clue with what he looks like. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal. In other words, they're going to fade away. They're earthly. They'll have no use. Like a used car loses value the first, as soon as you take it off, or a new car loses value as soon as you take it off the lot. Our bodies, all the things of the earth have been losing value for years. The pinnacle of evolution was when God first created man. Mankind has been devolving ever since. But the things which are not seen are eternal. We look to Jesus, who we don't see, but we love him. We look to him. We, we have the accounts of him in Scripture, but we yet don't see him face to face. We now no longer know him after the flesh. We know him through faith. Amen? Amen. Now let's go to, let's go to uh, chapter 5. I like these detours. See how bad I am? You know, I'm trying to drink a, a, a water with a, with a cap on. That's that senioritis. Chapter 5, verse 1. Once again, <clears throat> I had to go back because of that word 4. Because of all the, the light affliction that, that is temporary and because of the things that, that are seen are temporary and the things that are eternal are, are, are eternal. For we know if, if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, 
a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. This body, this tabernacle, he's talking about our physical bodies. One day it will be dissolved. There used to be a whole debate over what does dissolve mean? Well, put me in the ground for a couple of years, I'm going to be dissolved. But if the rapture happens, we don't know exactly what will happen, but we'll be changed. You know, our old, our old bodies will be nothing. They'll be, they'll be dissolved instantly. We try to picture that in our minds and we can't do it. And we'll have a new glorious one right away. We have a building of God and a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan. Yes, we do. <laughs> Amen. For this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. See, this would be the same hope that, that Paul's getting to in the last two verses of, of uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, you are our, our joy, our crown. We have this hope. You have the same hope that, that I have. That's what Paul basically is saying. And that it's, it's temporary. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Burden not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Mortality, this, this, I think when you, when you die, you first place you go is to the mortuary. They get your body ready. This dissolving body, they get it ready for, for burial, right? We have, we have, uh, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Our mortal bodies will be changed right away into those like unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God who also has given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. He ain't taking that earnest money back. You give an earnest to a bank, you're not getting that earnest money back. It's not a down payment. It's a promise that you're going to pay what you did. It's a non-refundable deposit. Amen? God has given us a non-refundable deposit on something that he'll never take away from us. Our eternal life. Our sealing with the Spirit. All those can never be done away with. Therefore, why? Because we have this earnest of the Spirit. Cannot be taken away, away from us. We, we have this hope that's on high. Therefore, we are 50% confident. <laughs> I actually heard an Easter message talking about, well, you might think you're 75% righteous or 80% righteous. Maybe you're, maybe you're only 20% righteous, but God will make you 100% righteous. We're 0% righteous. Doesn't matter before God, before a holy God. Therefore, we are always confident, confident knowing that whilst we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. Now, I try to rectify the, the fact that currently in position, we're seated in heavenly places with Christ. We have all these, these benefits that, that are before us. I'm looking personally at the benefits of retiring one day, not having to work. But that gets slimmer and slimmer because it seems like when you retire because of the rate of inflation and everything, you have to keep on working anyways. But... We, we, look, we look ahead to the Lord being absent from the body. We, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. That's our hope. That's our upward call that we have as believers. 
Everything this side of eternity is temporary. So why not nourish the eternal? Amen. It's, it's, it's sad in a way that so many people have rejected the simple grace of God and they need to have, do something. It's, an in, it's, an, it's a, a human thing. We feel like we have to be part of something. We need to do something to earn salvation. Just read Romans chapter 4 and that'll answer that whole thing. Not at all by the law, any law. I mentioned last week, we have actually one law, the law in Romans 8, 2. It says the law of the spirit of life in Christ. That's it. Just like the law of gravity. Trust what the Lord has done and not what we have, not, nor what we can do at all. Let's go to, uh, uh, let's see, I was already there. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians. But we, brethren, back to verse 17, just rereading it. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Verse number 19. For what is our hope or joy of crown of rejoicing? All right, so what is? Question. For the believer, what is the believer's hope, joy, and crown? I think we just looked at it, the fact of eternity, eternal life. Is that, is that joy, hope, and crown that we have? What kind of crown, what would you do with a crown? You, you wear it on your head, right? I never, I've, I've never worn a crown on my head except for a Burger King. That's it. That's the, <laughs> the best crown I've ever worn. And the, the only reason is because they're adjustable, you know, so you can fit any head with a Burger King crown. Right? <laughs> it is true. It's it says, but what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye? And this is in the in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. So Paul saying, You guys, you guys are our, our crown. You guys are, are, are what are the evidence of the work of Paul's work on the earth. The hope and joy and crown. Our hope, joy, and crown cannot be found in anything that we do earthly. It's all based on the heavenly promises of Jesus Christ. It says, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Now, I don't want to get into any, uh, a long thing about his coming. The context of his coming, much like the term, the day of Christ and the day of the Lord, needs to be taken into account. The day of the Lord will be the 70th week of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9. There's 483 weeks of years that have passed as one that has not been fulfilled out of those we've yet to have that that was interrupted at the, the beginning of the church it was interrupted and it will start once again the day of the lord will start with seven years of tribulation but the the time as it's that it starts will be in the, when the rapture of the church happens so you can find references to the rapture being part of the day of the Lord or the day of Christ. And at his coming in this case here, he's talking about you'll be found at the rapture. 2 Corinthians 5 that we just read about our earthly tabernacles being dissolved. <sighs> at the rapture, you'll be taking place. You'll have a new, new body, a new, uh, a new heavenly body. I referred to... Uh, these old clothes we have, we already have our custom spacesuits designed to be with the Lord. 
Amen? Now, in closing, verse number 20. For ye are our glory and joy. You know, as I, I don't know if I can speak for, uh, for other people that find themselves as being in the position of a pastor. It seems like the, so much of the church has become, become commercialized and, and ministers of the gospel by and large have, have gone the commercial route. You know, what sells? What will people buy? What will people find popular to do? If we did that, we'd be in, we'd have like a third floor in the building. If we were to bring in the rock bands and all that stuff. But the, it's not, it's not about the, who has the biggest commercial, the biggest, uh, I wrote it down. It's not a competition to see who can have the biggest congregation, the biggest buildings, and the biggest bank accounts. It's all about people growing in the grace of God and knowing the Lord, knowing the gospel that saves. It's the gospel that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Book of Ephesians, see, they, you believe and trust. You know, that's, that's the glory and crown of ministry is how many people, not how many people, it's, it's growing by by just like a body grows through good nourishment. You know, it's growing that way. Not necessarily growing in leaps and bounds physically, but spiritually. And when the focus is taken off the scriptures and put on any man, as I already mentioned earlier, Kenneth Copeland with the, the Jesus cookies that were brought to him, it, it may bring in a big audience, but it doesn't bring glory to God. You know, let us try to stay focused on the glory of God. Other believers are the joy and crown, or the glory, the glory and joy. I like it. I like how it says, "For ye are our glory and joy." Even though Paul could not physically see them, he longed to see them. He had he heard reports of how they were doing through their persecutions, through their trial. And what they did is they stayed focused on who the Lord Jesus Christ was and his work. That's our goal, stay focused. That's why he could later write in Colossians chapter 3, therefore set your minds on heavenly things rather than earthly things. Amen? Amen. That's our goal. That's how... That's how we can be the, the glory and joy by looking to him for all things. I like how we, we sang the song, God will take care of you. Amen. He does. That's something I cannot explain how that happens. But God does. You know, when you, when you trust him. And even when you don't, even when you get frustrated at things, God will take care of you. No matter what. Amen. Amen. That's, that's not closing. It's only quarter past 11. We can, let's find something else to do for like another half hour. <laughs> no, but amen. Our focus is on heavenly things. Hmm? Why, don't we, why don't we stand together and open our hymn books? I can get, yeah. Wait a minute, no, an angel will walk through the door with him. <laughs>